Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll get the introduction out of the way now. So, yeah, thanks for joining us tonight so for our chat with Andrew and Norm from Urban Green Farms. Um, first of all, I'd just like to sort of, um, if you're new to Stand Up Australia, you haven't been to one of these before, um, we are Stand Up Australia hosting this. Uh, so sometime in 2020, we started Stand Up to connect with people all over the country in a whole range of issues. So as we know, the vaccine was just one of the many concerns people were experiencing. And uh, along with other things, we wanted to create communities and connections around the country and give people ways of standing up and empowering them. So we started running face-to-face -face seminars and webinars like this, educating and connecting people on different topics. So in December 21, we started the Time to Unite tour, which is coming to all Eastern states. It's already been through WA, uh, South Australia and Victoria. It's going to be in New South Wales um, this month and next month. So, and this is featuring Peter Harris, leader of the um, uh, Australian Federation Party. So, and he explains uh, the perfect storm that is upon us for change and the six simple steps we can all take together to return Australia to a free and democratic country. So if you feel like you've gotten value from tonight's webinar and want to support us, or just want to learn more about us and uh, where Peter will be speaking next, head to Stand Up Australia now to register interest. All these uh, upcoming webinars will be on there as well. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Can everybody make sure they're on mute? Um, we don't want to distract the speakers. Uh, the session has also been recorded and will be shared in the coming days with everybody who was registered. So if you can also please save all your questions to the end and just chuck them in the chat and uh, either Andrew or Norm will answer them. Cool, I'll read them out, they can answer them. So yeah, so I'd like to introduce um, Andrew and Norm from Urban Green Farms and they're gonna sort of tell us what they do. <laughs> okay, would you like me to go first, Andrew? I'd like you to start, Norm. No problem. Okay, well, my, as you can see, my name's Norm Olson. I'm a soil microbiologist. I've been in the soil microbiology world for probably around 30 years. And I've done a lot of, I've originally done most of my training in the Nanjing University in Nanjing, China. I spent time in the biological unit at uh, the Beijing campus. I spent two years there learning a lot about different fungal diseases and particularly Panama disease, which we currently uh, experience today in banana plantations. Since that time, I've been very active amongst uh, a lot of farmers looking at uh, areas that these people have been suffering with, particularly with things like the cerium oxysporum attack, phytophoras, and these types of fungal diseases that most people that are not on farms probably don't know a lot about, but they are very detrimental. They can completely wipe a farm out in a very, very short period of time if they get a handle. And so we've been uh, very, very uh, active in showing farmers how they can control this particular area by the utilization of what nature has provided us. And that is beneficial bacterium, as well as beneficial fungi. The biota issue, as far as soil is concerned, has only really come to light in real terms over the last five years. Because most of the chemical companies, uh, particularly the pesticide and fungal side producers, really don't want you to understand exactly what goes on inside the soil and what can be done without using these some of these products that literally destroy the biota inside the soil as well as a lot of the fabric of the soil itself. My, my uh, uh, training and my research over these years has found that a lot of the blames has gone on to things like chemical fertilizers, mineral fertilizers. Well, a lot of this is, is quite wrong because soil does need a certain amount of rare earth. And that's what we do when we use uh, in a lot of the mineral fertilizers, particularly the trace elements. Unfortunately, the way the seeds are produced today and the way that seeds are presented to us in a hybrid form, it's like taking a foreign object and putting it into 
the soil because the soil simply doesn't recognise it. And I'm sure Andrew will talk a lot more about this a little bit later on. But chemical fertilisers, when we look at the true value of the actual mineral part of the chemical fertiliser, we need it. We have to have it because the biology utilises it. And when the biology is in there, it becomes converted and therefore we get the benefit from it. The problem is over the years and particularly in the last 30 years, and even so prior to that, when we first introduced the first two farrow plough, we have been slowly but surely destroying our biological activity in our soil, simply by turning the soil over and exposing it to the ultraviolet light. And that has been the biggest problem we've had over that term. Then of course, we did away with that and we moved to no-till. Now, no-till no -till is very, very good. And it's been very, very uh, successful in certain areas. But there's also other areas where it's actually turned the soil anaerobic. And once again, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So that's, that's basically my story. And I'd like to now to turn it over to Andrew and let Andrew tell us a little bit about what he does. Well, um, thanks, Norm. Thanks for that. I, um, I actually met Norm a couple of years back, about three or four years ago. We've um, now been working together for a while. Um, Norm has taught me a lot, come from a very similar background, although I'm from originally from the hydroponics and aquaponics industry. Um, we do, back then it was more so, I, I, I had very little faith in soil. Um, which is precisely why I thought hydroponics and aquaponics would be the alternative for the survival of the human race um, on this planet in terms of being able to feed nine and a half billion people you know, within however long it's supposed to be. I think it's over the next 10 years or so, next 20 years, it's supposed to be at nine and a half billion. I'm not sure whether, it's, whether we're going to actually achieve that now. Um, but more so... Um, what had happened was I was, I sat in a um, in a conference at um, in the United States with a group called Kiss the Ground, and at the time I um, I watched really closely in terms of what was going on, and I realised at the very moment that there's no point shifting to aquaponics and hydroponics if there's no soil, there's no ice, um, and so we had to have a look at a way that we could fix the soil and call it a, a moment of fate. Um, I met Norm. Um, this incredible brains, this incredible product, but we were missing a bit of grunt to the whole thing um, by which we really needed to, to not just advocate for soil um, and regen, but also provide a booster, a way to accelerate the regenerative process by supplemental biological products. Um, and that's where Norm and I started a program called Operation Saviour, by which we've pulled together the collective strength of a whole bunch of consortium partners that I'm not going to reveal over this at the moment. Um, a lot of it's still quite confidential, but some of them being in the United States, um, a couple of big organisations in the United States, a couple over here, um, a drone a drone organization, um, a hyperspectral imaging uh, group, um, probes by which we're able to calculate carbon, carbon CEC and carbon drawdown um, into the soil and issue out carbon credits directly to the farmers via by um, by the crypto by the crypto market and blockchain. Um, we've essentially been able to put the farmer at the center of everything that we're doing. The significance of this is where it kind of falls into play with what I've been doing for the last 10 years, or call it seven years that I started the company. Um, and I know it sounds kind of doom and gloom, but I started the company originally to be able to teach people how to grow food in the event of an economic collapse, because there was there's an inevitable economic collapse that was set for essentially 2020. Um, and all of a sudden we've had COVID. Um, but what we've found is we've got two main things that happen 
um, within a society that essentially build the foundations of a society. And I think a lot of Australians and I think a lot of people fail to recognise particular things as to why we actually, why our national anthem is so important and why we even say with golden soil, both for toil within our national anthem. And I'm not sure if there's anyone that's really actually looked into that. Um, and this, and these are some of the things that I'll explain, but that's essentially my story. And, you know, we're one of the suppliers to um, the education sector for aquaponics suppliers, as well as STEM education, um, you know, products. We've got a vast range of supplemental, you know, uh, products, glass houses, greenhouses, products from aquaponic units all the way through to hydroponic lighting tents, the whole shebang. So it doesn't matter where you are or what you do, whether or not you're in an apartment or on a farm, we can supply, provide, and um, essentially train and teach at the same time. We also have a lot of online courses for schools, um, and that's what the company does, essentially here to provide food security solutions. Um, and that's probably the most important thing that we could do. And the only way that we can provide that security is through soil through the regeneration of our soil. Um, and that's me in a nutshell. I'm not sure if you want to uh, take over that for a moment. <laughs> I think I think one of the interesting things is that most, most times you get a webinar, uh, people get attracted because they're very interested in in the actual discussion that's taking place and, and they want to find out more because there's a lot of information floating around out there in the marketplace that simply is not accurate. It's all driven towards sales of product. It's all driven towards certain types of companies gaining advantage. And when you really tear that all away and actually have a look at what is actually going on, then, um, and you ask the average person who, who this really affects, they're, they're very interested. I, I was very surprised when uh, I was in a, in a bunning store just recently and I was standing in the garden section because I wanted to have a look at the range of uh, waters that they've got there that people buy every day to, to actually stimulate plants and all this type of thing. And as I said to a lot of the people there, when you have a look at the 18 or 19 products on there, you can do the same thing with a, car, with a tablespoon full of brown sugar. It'll do exactly the same thing. And, and, and it started a discussion, but what came out of that discussion was people need to want to know. They're, they're thirsty for, for really good, factual, honest information regarding soils. And I think a lot of people would have heard, Andrew and, and others, that soils ain't soils. And that's a very true so statement. Soils are not just soils. They're a living form. Each time we walk upon them, what is happening beneath our feet is amazing. It's absolutely incredible. One hectare of land has 96 tonnes of different types of bacteria and fungi all grouped into the one area. We have 630 million different genres and varieties of different biota that float around in the soil. And that is only about 35% of what we've been able to actually discover already. There's still a lot out there we don't know. Well, the truth is we know more about space than we know about soil at this point. So exactly right. Uh, it's bizarre that you know that we're looking outside of you know our own world when we've got a world beneath us that we don't even know about. Uh, well, the world beneath us is it. is quite complex. It's very well balanced, and nature nature made it that way. It was very well balanced. Norman. It was very well balanced. Exactly yeah. right. But so today, of course, we've got the lower subsoils, which holds a lot of the nasties that we we experience today, is now finding its way into the growth medium. And that's the first 15 centimetres of soil in which we basically do most of our growing in. And that's happened simply because we've, excuse this language, but bastardised the, the, the beauty of what that growing mechanism really represents. And we've destroyed, without realising it, by the way, we've destroyed a lot of the fabric, which is driven by biological activity within that growing mechanism. 
Now today, of course, in the last, I suppose in the last two to three years, the word biological activity has become normal part of our speech. People are starting to talk about it. They want, they want to know more about it and they want to know what it's about. In the 1980s, when this particular type of uh, activity started to rear its head, we were all pushed back into the black corner by the big chemical companies and said, you're not going to say anything. We don't want to know about you. You're talking rubbish. And yet it was very real and it was factual. But, of course, we stayed there for many years and now we're finally being drawn out and people are starting to ask questions. Well, and what I'm very happy about here, Andrew, is that Mrs Jones that goes to the supermarket is our biggest advocate. She wants good quality food for her children, for the generations that are growing. And farmers have that responsibility to produce that. Yeah. And right at the moment, farmers don't know what to do because they're bombarded with so much information and so many different products. Well, absolutely. Which are good and which are bad. Absolutely. And the farmers are, you know, right now, and what, and, and I think, Norm, what, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see a major problem. It's at the very core of this country is soil. At the very core, it's a farming nation. It's, you know, and it's the heartland of, of what, of what we produce it's food now um when you when we really have a look at what we've done over the last 40 50 years with this call it modern agricultural experiment um it's no different to what happened in in the 19 in the 1930s as well you know when we saw um across the united states um you know the depletion of their soil the dust storms throughout middle america um and this is what really drove my interest in my, my relationship with Norm was, was based on understanding what's happened in history. And when we look at history, you can really see into the future. Essentially, we make the same cyclical patterns. And unfortunately, as, a, as humanity, we seem to think that we're exceptional from the laws of physics and the laws of science and the laws of mother nature as we progressively become modernized and technologically advanced. We think that, you know, mother, our land becomes the enemy instead of us being able to work for it um, and really understand it. And perhaps it is, it's profit driven um, and they're ignoring, they're ignoring the main issue here, which is actually going to be the complete destruction of the soil and our food security issues. So from my point of view, history does have a real way of showing us the future. And if you have a look at what happened in the 1920s, we saw the Spanish flu, then we saw World War One, and then, you know, 1930s, we hit the Great Depression, which lasted about a decade. And we understand why that happened. That was basically because people saw no way out. But there was a, but there's actually a blueprint that's been created. And that was by Franklin D. Roosevelt at the time in 1937. It's probably the wisest politician in the United States at that point, and he became the president of the United States. And you know, one of his key, one of his key strategies to fix the United States was to recover the soil. One of his greatest statements is, "A nation that destroys its soil destroys itself," and that rings true. We have some of the oldest soil in the world here in Australia. And if the United States has fifty years worth of tillable soil left, according to um, according to the UN. I'd be surprised if we're anywhere near 50 years of tillable soil. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly what that is right now, but, you know, the selling off of our resources, our water supplies, um, you know, it's, it's something that we really need to, that we really need to look at and as well as protecting and enhancing our, our collective natural assets and commercializing them in a way that actually benefits us and, no one's really been able to crack the code on how to do that. And I believe we have at this point um, amongst us and amongst this pop, this pop, this population. Then what we saw was World War II broke out. And as Norm was talking about pesticides and some people don't understand the history of pesticides and where they actually came from. And when you really understand where pesticides came from, they, there's actually a wonderful documentary called Kiss the Ground, you should watch it, it's on Netflix. Uh, we'll put it up shortly as well. Um, 
that explains part of this. And part of the issue is these pesticides were actually what was used in the gas chambers to kill millions of people, um, you know, during Hitler's reign and primarily six million Jewish people. And from that moment, what we saw was after the war, they rebranded those very same chemicals under the guise of pesticides. And exactly right, Zylan B, thank you very much. <laughs> Zylan B. And during that time, um, they started a war on insects instead. And I, and I keep saying this at the core of ego, egotistical men, and I say it with passion because it's men that are primarily the ones that are greedy. Um, and we have had a, a, high, a hierarchy of greedy, egotistical men at the very top that have actually put their profits beyond anything else. And we've broken the cardinal rule into the intergenerational rule is leave a better world for the future generation. And we're not doing that right now, but we can. And the thing is, once that happened, you know, you have a look at it and every problem is, every problem seems to be a nail and every solution's a hammer. Then in 1973, what we saw was development of hybrid seeds and particular scientists had developed these seeds that you can't actually do any peer reviews on or testing. You need to, you need to seek approval. They need to have a look at that. So, um, and these so-called advancements in technology were actually the very same, the, the very same methods that were actually causing the destruction of the soil. And, you know, they promised everything from great yields and less water usage, insect repellent, disease, and essentially at the cost or the expense of the soil itself. Um, and I explain this, what Norm has just spoken about in terms of the scientific side of it, I explain it like the human gut. And, you know, the human gut's very similar biologically to soil. And if I was to give you a lung today, what would happen to your body? Your body would reject it. It's foreign RNA in your DNA of your body. And so the only way to accept it is by taking an immune suppressor. You take an immune suppressant, you're susceptible to reoccurring infections, carcinogenic effects, cancer, bacterial problems, all sorts of issues. And so then you end up from the cause being an agricultural industry problem that's caused this infliction of chronic disease. And this essentially it's an investment into 20, 25 years of chronic illness but then you end up in the same organizations that own these organizations are the very same organizations that own the chemotherapy and all the, all the medical industry, essentially. Um, and so we end up in this vicious cycle of, of, of infliction of chemicals and, and, and disease, essentially, that's proliferated throughout humanity. And then we all end up in the same system, which is the farm which is the pharmaceutical industry. So my question to people usually is at this point is, what do we do in 50 years when you've got no, you know, we've got no tillable soil left. We've seen throughout human history, what happens when soils degraded? Look at Africa. Africa was once thriving in its biodiversity and now it's, it's really struggling. And that's how you have massive movements of, of populations up into other countries. Um, I'm sure, you know, no one really wants to leave their country if it was thriving and it was, and it was prosperity and wealth and opportunity. And we're in this position where Australia was the lucky country. I'm not so sure we're so lucky at this point. Um, we can be, and we can restore what was lost or what is being lost. Um, and the sad thing is, you know, I was recently in Colac and we talk about intergenerational farming. I spoke to a 14 year old girl that said to me, um, I said to her, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, I want to be a dairy farmer, but dad won't let me. I said, why? She said, because there's no money in it. We work too hard. And I said, so what are you guys going to do? They're probably going to sell the farm. And who's going to end up buying that farm? Um, primarily be a corporation or a big buying group or a superannuation fund. 
So from my point of view, if we don't have intergenerational farming, we don't have a future for our children. If we don't have a future for our children, there's no future for us, really. We've, we've, we've failed at, at the highest level of morality, spirituality, and essentially um, very fabric of humanity and what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so from my point of view, we look at this and we say, farmers are the backbone. We need to understand that farmers are the backbone of this country. And if farmers are happy, and if farmers are supported, and they're provided with the right information to really understand how they can increase their profits, the yields, use less water and work with nature, um, I think we have a fighting chance to get through this. Uh, I'm not sure if Norm wants to add anything in there. Or, yeah, you know, Andrew, one of, one of the interesting things is that we talk about farmers and, and, and I've, I've, I've dealt with farmers, as, you, as I've just said before, for over 30 years. I was a farmer myself. I was a dairy farmer when I was 18 years old. And I was around when um, the, the first superphosphate started to appear on the market which in those days was just pure bird manure. That's what they made it out of. But when you look at where we've come from since the early 60s to where we are today, we haven't made much progress. In fact, we've gone backwards because farmers no longer control their own destiny. It's controlled by the big uh, corporations. It's controlled by agronomists. And agronomists today come out of a college. They're not taught really anything about uh, biology to a certain extent. They're mentioned, it's mentioned in there in some of their studies, but there's no real hard literature involved in the learning process. So when they come out, of course, agronomists are, 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 are trained to look at the soil as the chemical companies look at. They look at the way they look at it. That is, in a lot of sense, that's not, there's not a, that's not a complete uh, a problem in itself because agronomists, you need them. We've got to have them. They're the soil doctors. These are the guys that can come in and they can show and change and, and show a farmer what he needs to do. However, it's the information flow to them that needs to be rejigged and re reestablished. And I, and I keep, whenever I talk to people, I come back to the same thing time and time again. The Amish, the Amish, the people who live in Pennsylvania in the United States have got it bloody right. They've been doing it for centuries. Yes, they've introduced modern machinery, but they still have the basics of looking after their soil. It is their guy, it's their whole lifeline, it is their soils. Not plants, essentially. Kiss the Ground is based a lot on the philosophy of what these Amish have been doing for centuries. Kiss the Ground has improved it. Wonderful. They've done it the right way. So what we need to do in this country, particularly, we have to now, we need to get back to the basics of what it's about. And you just went through World War II, all of these things, the, the, the start of pesticides. You're absolutely correct, Andrew. Pesticides were just relabeled. Anything that you put on your property that you must use a mask, you must be covered, you can't afford to breathe it in, you've got to keep your hands away from it, you've got to do all these sorts of things, and yet we're spraying it on the bloody food that we eat. It's absurd. It's absurd. It's absolutely, absolutely absurd. And people wonder why they're sick with you know immunocompromised you know, issues and cancer and all sorts of issues. It's you know, it comes back to the whole food to the whole food network. But where how this is important in terms of the economy and, and, and when we look at big picture here, and this is something where I was, um, as we saw over the last two years, it's been quite challenging, especially here in Victoria. We, you know, we saw the greatest lockdowns we've ever seen, you know, in terms of the longest, we've struck the record for, for the longest lockdown in, essentially human history, I think it was. Um, but if we're left in this situation, we've got 50 years worth of tillable soil, and that's, that's if we do at this point. Um, and we understand that 
how Franklin D. Roosevelt pulled the United States out of that Great Depression. We have a blueprint to how we can revive this nation as well as create the same type of industrial revolution that he created, but in a green industrial revolution. And here's where we started to pull a lot of things together, Norman and I. And so how do we do it? And is it possible? And what if we could draw down that carbon and offset our entire emissions as a country um, and hit those net zero targets that have been imposed on this country um, without really having to change much, but it gives us an opportunity and the time to transition to, re to renewable en energies whilst we actually supplement and support our current mining industries and fossil fuel industries. And we do have a comment here regarding mining and we will get back to that. Um, Norm is very, he'll be very excited about that question, Yara, um, because it's something that we are very excited about and we can, and we can fix. Um, so we, we will run through that very quickly, but what our farmers are dealing with now, which is an already horrible situation is that we've neglected our farmers and that's our fault in the cities um you know we sit here we sip on our lattes i'm i'm guilty of that as well i mean i live in concrete jungle in the middle of paran you know I, you know we sit here and and i think we uh we're disconnected from what's really important and that's our food and where it comes from and my question to a lot of people who are out there at this point protesting still if you want to protest for something, protest for our farmers, you go to the farmers and you go help them in regional development zones. Take your friends, go help them. You want, you want to protest for freedom, you unshackle our farmers, you unshackle our nation, you unshackle us, essentially. Andrew, we've got to give farmers ownership again. Absolutely. We have to give our farmers the right to ownership and control their own destiny. We've taken that away from them. And the moment, once we get that back and farmers start to realise their responsibility to the human race. Most farmers farm because it's a lifestyle. That's what it's set out to do. It's become an enterprise. And it's a lot more than just an enterprise. It's a business. And unfortunately, they're failing because they can't control it. It's been taken away from them. Every time a farmer makes a decision, he's got to ring two people, his bank manager and accountant, or otherwise he can't make a decision. And if they say no, he doesn't do it. And it's getting That's worse. how now. bad it's got. Well, it's getting worse now because the cost of fruits has gone through the roof. Absolutely. But not only that, the supermarkets yeah. now are going in for the kill. Yeah. The supermarkets are going in for the kill. And what they're doing is they're now rejecting good quality product simply because they want to hold the price up. We have supply. We have product out there to come into our supermarkets. It's there, but it's been held back by the supermarket chains to hold the price. The profit margins are more important than the, the livelihood of the population. Well, That's what it comes down to. And this is and there's ways around that norm. You know, we've got half a million people protesting across the country. How about you start protesting in anger and go pick up that, you know, pick up that food, bring it out, stay around. Right. No. I heard today on the radio one particular very enterprising farmer down near Colac. He's a vegetable grower. The supermarkets walked in and reduced, uh, rejected his entire crop because they had an oversupply. Well, that's a load of rubbish anyway. What he did was got on the local radio station down there and told people, come and buy directly from me. I'll sell it to you at a good price and you can get it direct from the farm. Now, how, this is an enterprising sort of person that I like. These are people that we need more of. Well, this is exactly why this is exactly what Serene is doing in terms of, you know, in terms of co-vision. Um, you know, we are going to start seeing a lot of a lot of networks open up for farming and for logistics in terms of being able to purchase that stock and get it through, you know, and get it through the networks. But more importantly, Norm, what we kind of what we what people are you know, really here for is how does all this affect our economy, our prosperity, our well-being, and how does it how does it actually work? Here? Well, if, if you so, want a, if you want a, a perfect example of, of what happens when an agriculture industry gets to a point 
of no return. You've only got to look at Sri Lanka right now. Sri Lanka is on its knees. Its governments have dissolved. Ministers have walked out. People are rioting in the streets because they had industries like the aquaculture industry where they were selling prawn or shrimp, a $12 billion industry deflated to less than $25 million a year turnover now. Jesus. They've got farmers that have just walked away because what they did was the government decided to stop all use of any type of chemical fertilizer and said it had to be total organic. Well, that's a great idea in theory, but you've got to take time to actually get that implemented. And it backfired on them. Now, of course, the farmers, because they'd lost control, don't know how to come back. In fact, I'm heading to Sri Lanka in two weeks' time. I've been asked to come over there by the government to address a lot of their problems they've got there at the moment and see if we can rectify it by introducing new programs into the farming community there. Well, because essentially well, all they're doing is they're pumping more. It's just it's more chemical firts, more energy, more and 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 what we call it in hydroponics is lockup. Well, what, you ask the question of what, what, what's this going to affect us? Well, when you look at that, that can happen here. It can really happen here. Don't think it can't because it can. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That's why we're here today. And I'm not suggesting here. for one minute we're at that stage right now. We're not. But we are heading down that road. And we've got to now take action at this point, not when it happens now to try and curb that problem. There's an old saying in Australia, Australia was built on the sheep's back. Today, everybody says it's being built on the mining back. Well, if China tomorrow morning decide to stop taking our iron ore, what do we live on? Because our agriculture industry is on its, on its knees. It's deflated. It's, it's, it's got nothing. It's, it's just surviving. So if you take that sort of industry and you start you take the biggest buyer in the world says i don't want you anymore what do we do yeah absolutely so which is exactly why operation saver exists exactly so here's where things get really interesting how do we bring together the agricultural industry what's going on with our energy sectors what's going on with carbon with you know with drawdown um the commercialization of carbon and how do we actually bring that to the forefront of a complete closed loop system that actually encourages the stock market to do the right thing? Because at the end of the day, it's corporate. Let's provide an alternative. And this is where people aren't looking. This is where our government essentially isn't looking either at the moment, which some are. And, and there's some ministers out there that I can, I can note that are really trying to make a difference. But the solutions this pathway that we're seeing right now towards where they're going is neither left or right are providing solutions. So it's become a sledging match. It's become, it's, it's all personal now and no one's actually providing a solution. It's just, it's a big show. And what we need to do is, is actually provide a solution from the ground up. And this is where, Operation Savior comes into play. I'm going to, um, I'm just going to quickly show, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have already seen this video, but I'm going to steal the, I'm going to steal this for a, for a moment. And I, I'd really like people to, to watch this at some stage, if you haven't already seen it. This is the Kiss the Ground trailer. And Sorry. There's so much bad news about our planet. It's so warm. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet, and this is all this dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. If 
fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soil, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant, healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. So, so while we, while we sit here and there's a lot of information out there now about, you know, regenerative agriculture, how do we actually take that and commercialise it in a way that works for us and for our farmers and essentially for the entire economy? And that's where the appeal is. We need to provide solutions and alternatives. And, you know, for example, I very often... I've got a personal, um, I've got a personal issue with what's going on in our logging industry in this country, and I'm, I'm going to put it out there. It's, it's a major problem, um, and I'm not sure if people know really what's going on in the Highland regions of Victoria. You know, for example, and we're going to come back to a lot of these, a lot of these issues, in, you know, in terms of what's going on, and it is, it's, it's scary in terms of the hypocrisy that's happening here. And on in one vein, they speak of, you know, we need to get to net zero, but yet in our own backyard in Hillsville, we have a forest uh, out there that is actually an amazing sequester of carbon, but it's also the most important ecological asset that we have in Victoria, but yet we're logging it for cheap paper and, this is what it looks like right now. There's an ancient place very few know about, the land stretching east and across the Great Dividing Range. It's home to rare wildlife and the incredible source of all our drinking water. This place is sacred to our first people and a rare jewel to all Victorians. Ancient forests, marvellous beasts that are the world's tallest flowering trees. These forests literally feed our water, invigorating the great city of Melbourne. And within these flowing rivers, there's unique life and connection. As the ferns open up, there's landscapes sweeping as far as the eye can see this extraordinary country we call home. The patchwork of forests, watercourses of volcanic outcrops created over 350 million years. Journey on horseback, cross country on foot, climb the sheer and rocky escarpments, paddle the many tributaries and negotiate the very heart of the forest watery channels. And as you cross the withered soil, you're sure to witness beauty and now devastation in equal measure. Our central highlands forests are collapsing from logging and fires. The mighty trees are truly unique wildlife going extinct. Logging these native forests for cheap paper at an intangible cost to all Victorians because it operates at a loss a loss. With only 1% of the old growth forest left and climate change taking its toll, we have to stop logging, have to preserve the very source of our precious water, because once they're gone, they're gone. 
these forests store more carbon per hectare than any other forest on the planet and are the ecological cradle of Victoria. They harness our drinking water, supply our farms, our food. Standing, they're worth immeasurably more standing than lying down. We are the trees, the creatures, the places and people that make up what could be Victoria's Great Forest National Park. Come on, Robert, let's make it happen. So while we have all these benefits of this particular of this particular forest becoming a great forest national park, Vic Forest, and I'm going to call them out publicly, the very organization that is supposed to be protecting that forest is spying on one of our partners um, and stakeholders being Sarah Reese. Now you can look this up yourself it's on news it's on abc it's it's on sbs right now um they essentially issued out an investigator to follow her around and find bird on her to try to shut her up essentially to protect 90 jobs in the highland regions of victoria which are unionized by which there have been no solutions labor liberal greens nationals no one's been able to provide solutions because there's no lateral thinking there's no critical thinking and there's no ideas there's no innovation and the problem with that is is it's career politicians and you know career politicians and uh in government that have been in there their whole lives and really have no clue of the real world so we end up with these people in there that couldn't even read a balance sheet my issue with this is there is a solution there is a way out and this builds part of Operation Saviour, which is hemp. And, you know, we need to make it much easier for farmers to be able to grow hemp as well, a normal way in on this at some point as well, that one acre of hemp grown in 120 days is equivalent to already out a pine tree grown in 20 years in its fibre content. We could quite literally reinvent this country and form a new industrial green revolution and be essentially the leaders in what we should be doing, which is restore manufacturing and support our regional development zones and intergenerational farming and consciousness of our native titles and what's going on here in this country and respecting country Australia essentially and um everything's being done at the highest levels of of these groups to sabotage that i think andrew one of the things that we must also uh let people know that when we talk about hemp we're talking about industrial hemp exactly we're not talking about the wacky tobacco stuff we're talking about industrial hemp that timber can come from they're now being able to produce aviation fuel from it there's so many different things now that they can actually do for this. But if I could just go back and touch on the CO2. The CO2 is definitely, and we all know this, definitely an issue. And our soils and our plant life and everything contributes to the conversion of it. But there's one silent killer out there that we don't talk about. And yet it's worse than CO2. It's called nitrous oxide. It's in our stratosphere, it controls our weather patterns, and it's very, very dangerous, and it is accumulating at an enormous rate because it's produced from everything we do. It's not just factories, it's not just coal mining, it's everything. The biggest converters of this particular gas is biological activity, but Industrial hemp, one hectare of industrial hemp can convert more nitric oxide than 100 hectares of any other crop because the plant lives and thrives on these types of products. Yeah. Yeah. CO2, it converts more CO2 than any other plant on the, on the face of this planet. And yet our governments can't see the forest for the trees. Excuse the pun. 
Okay. It's a farmer, it's a secondary income to farmers. They have all the infrastructure sitting there. They can grow it and it can be very, benefic very beneficial to our economy. But it's also helping us by well, growing it. Well, here's where there's a middle ground now. We find the middle ground between, you know, the conservatives and the right wing and the left wing here. And we start to look at where there's a middle ground, where, where our policies as, as a nation and what our, our politicians should be really focusing on is central policies that are neither left nor right, but central to the hearts of every Australian. And that starts with the farmer and our soil. We've got to work from the ground up again. So we talk about this in terms of, you know, it's, it's potential, but why aren't more people jumping on to hemp farming right now? And the truth is, and I'll make this very clear, they're making it very difficult in two particular states. It's actually not even difficult, it's just confusing. So in Victoria and in WA, they call it low THC cannabis. Whereas in New South Wales, where there's not much logging going on, funny enough, they call it low THC hemp and they've got themselves what they call the Industrial Hemp Act. Um, it took me a week and a half to get this document, the application for industrial hemp, because the department kept sending me through to the TGA because apparently I want to grow dope, which I don't. I was looking more specifically for the hemp applications, which are actually quite easy to fill out and will help any farmer or any person that wants to transition into hemp farming. We'll take care of the whole process for them if need be, um, all the way through to the business planning. Um, and as Norman said, it is the fast, it is the fastest essentially sequester of carbon in the world. But how do we bring it all together in a way that becomes viable to the farmer? as well as us. And this is just a short clip on Operation Saviour, but more specifically, there's a product range that sits behind this that is the essentially the fecal transplanting of soil, as we said, beneficial bacteria. It's all about soil immunity and creating soil air and its ability to retain and hold moisture in water and biodiversity. And this is Soil Saviour.
and there you have it. Um, I think the catchphrase here, Andrew, is happy soils switches on what switched off. chemicals have switched off. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and that's, that's where, basically what it boils down to. And that's where we're able to really now show the world the product and the actual range that's about to come out and hit the market. But it's also, I'm not here to sell product i'm actually here to just give people an idea of what one idea is for how we can fix some of our most crucial issues in this country but also globally um and that's you know if we continue down that path of where we're going it's insanity we're, we're all going to fall off a cliffside we've progressed into regression at this point but this is how this is what's actually coming out but the importance of this is we need we need to be able to create awareness, just like the organics industry did with organics and the demand for it. There needs to be an awareness amongst the general public that perhaps you shouldn't be buying so many products that are riddled with pesticides and herbicides, and maybe we need to be reframing what organics really is. Um, you know, if we have a look at the regenerative organic certification, it's standard out of the United States, which is called ROC, which is USDA approved. And, you know, we've got many people in this country, many great farmers and many great agronomists and who are trying to push for a standard here for regenerative agriculture because part of it is animal welfare, soil health, and then the other part is farmer fairness by which farmers need to be paid accordingly. They need to be paid fairly, not 20 cents to a litre of milk, which is what they're getting while you know, the guys in the suits that aren't really doing much at the stock market, at the exchange, are making money off their shares and their shareholders and their dividends. Um, really, the people that are doing the work should be, um, you know, should be awarded the most out of it. And that's not what we're seeing right now. So this is essentially how the pro this is the product range. And how it works. Importantly, Norm, where this sits right now in terms of soil regen and, and the commonality between humanity is this is the common ground. All this fighting, everything that we're doing um, can really be avoided. And, you know, the unification of Australians, you know, we're so, we're so divided as a society, but across the entire Western world, well, essentially across the world, everyone's divided at this point. And everything's marginal in terms of it's, it's unimportant. The most important thing right now is under our feet, and it's a war that we should be fighting for the health of our soil. And it's a peaceful war. It doesn't have to be violent. More hands obviously make light work. And we need to get out the message in terms of, what we can do as individuals, what we can do as businesses, what we can do as politicians, as scientists, as corporate leaders, wherever you are across the world, we need to focus on fixing the core of the issues, which are our soil. Andrew, in World War, when World War II broke out, many of the young guys in Australia were all conscripted. They all signed up to go and fight a war for our freedom. 
people who were working on farms were asked to stay on the farms because they were treated as very, very important because they were the backbone of all supply that would go to feed our troops. They also would feed our, our communities. They were the income stream. They were everything. And so they were regarded farmers as a very, very important part of our society. But since the middle 80s, farmers have become nothing. Nobody really cares what a farmer does or what he thinks. Yes, there is some people that walk around and they, they say, well, the poor farmer, but that's as far as it goes. And many farmers today, as you know, you've been with me and heard them. They're one GST check away from going broke. And that is not just a, that is fact. It's not a dream. It's not someone trying to sensationalize oh, something. Oh, no, 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 it's no. Real. I, completely, I completely agree. And I've seen some of these, you know, some of these farmers are a million dollars deep in, you know, with debt with, with these big ag companies. And the problem is the moment they try to switch, the ad companies call in the debt. Yep. Or or their the farms. And throw them off the farm. And so, you know, we've got a major, let's call it what it is. Let's not beat around the bush with the issues here. And we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not politicians. We'll leave that to Peter to deal with. But um, the Australian Federation Party and, and them to deal with. I'm not a politician. And I'm going to call the bullshit for what it is. And it's bullshit. What's going on to our farmers. It's unfair. And it's criminal. And this is potentially one of the greatest crimes that's ever been committed against humanity in terms of what they've, the, the destruction of our soil. And we need to stand firm and stand together now and say enough's enough. Well, we also, just to, add, just to add one more piece to that, we talk about the destruction of our soils and what farmers have been made to do and the instigators have been the supermarket chains. Absolutely. They're the, they're the ring bloody leaders. They're the people who have forced these poor farmers into doing things that they know they shouldn't do just in the name of profit. And where does the profit lie? It doesn't come back to the farmer. It certainly goes well, into their out, pockets. Farmers need to be able to lean on someone or a group of people by which they can check their legals. They can check their contracts, whether or not they're getting screwed in the middle of it. Yep. And we're happy to support that as well. We're happy to get CoVision and a whole bunch of other people that are lawyers who can actually decipher what half of this jargon is that's in there, these commercial agreements, and put what's, make it right, make it fair and make it reasonable and let the farmer know in layman's terms, in terms of what are in these contracts and what you're actually committing to because you're going to get screwed and eventually you're going to foreclose your farm into kicking a can down the, down the street by doing this. We can talk about regenerative farming. We can talk about the lack of biological activity in soils. We can talk about soil degradation. But if we can't help the actual people who work that soil, what hope have we got? Because the soil can't fix itself. It needs help. It's past fixing itself. Yes, you can regenerate when a bushfire goes through because it produces carbon and things grow back pretty well from the carbon. But we're talking about enterprises where farmers are basically hogtied. They can't move. They're too frightened to move. Either the bank manager's going to come in and foreclose, or their accountant's going to send them a bill that they'll choke on, or the big chemical companies are going to forego on them. So what's got to happen here is somebody somewhere has got to get some common sense, I believe. Now, as I said, I'm not a politician. I can't stand politicians. But what I am is a farmer's advocate because I work with them. I live, breathe farmers, and I see good farmers, really hardworking farmers suffering. You go in and talk to a farmer and the next minute he's sitting there with tears rolling down his face. He doesn't Absolutely. know where to turn. Absolutely, I've seen it. I've, I've seen it myself. And in my view, if this is a platform that I can talk about this sort of thing going on, then I'll use it. Because as far as I'm concerned, every farmer in this country needs a pat on the back and they should be all living a lifestyle. They don't need to be rich and famous. They just need to live a lifestyle that they can pass on to their children and their children onto their children. Absolutely. And that's what we've got to have. Because yeah. if we haven't got farmers, we've got nothing. 
And let's just go back to another cause of this is the selling off of our resources, our water, as well as the logging industry in itself for cheap paper. The alternative is hemp. And the alternative is to redeploy our union members into green infrastructure projects and regional development zones to essentially stop the logging and provide our paper mills and our paper companies with an alternative. And these are the things that they can't do. They can't think about this as career politicians. So it's why they need to lean on the true private sector, not your big conglomerates, but your true private sector that are actually coming up with the innovation and the ideas. That's where we can actually start in terms of we need to stop that old forest logging, give it back to the native people, give it back to the first people here. They can, they know this land better than we ever will. And we need to start respecting the Indigenous culture here and really understand what their problems are and the way that they manage the land to fix it. Give it back to them. It's theirs. And we're doing the wrong thing. And we keep doing it. And we're ignoring it. We've got to get to the core of the problems. So from my point of view, we're sitting here going, well, you know what? We've got two options here. We can either continue to degenerate and more of the same, and all we're going to find is pestilence and famine and war, or we regenerate and provide an era of freedom and fairness, quality, neutrality, respect for ourselves, respect for nature, and more importantly, we respect the very thing that allows us to survive, which is our soil. And I think, um, I think we have failed as a society. I think we're so disconnected from nature, from living out in these in these jungles, these concrete jungles, and being on our iPhones all the time, we're so desensitized to what's really happening out there, and and Mother Nature's suffering for it, and eventually we will as well, unless we change the course. This is what I believe is, from my point of view, this is where we are in terms of what our work is. Everyone has a role to do, and everyone has a job to do in their particular fields to create innovation and um, efficiency, and we need to stop protecting, essentially, as a country, we need to stop protecting fossil industries. And I mean fossil industries like dinosaur industries that are still existing. So for example, you know, if we weren't subsidising BHP or any of the big mining companies or any of the big steel companies, they would already have alternatives. They'd be looking at windmills, you know, for example. But the problem is not policy. The problem is there's too much policy get out of the way and let competition do what competition needs to do and stop protecting these industries because they will fall over. There's innovation there and there's many ideas and there's great technology out there that can essentially work for the betterment of society and the betterment of humanity. So that's where I'm in at it, but um, I'm sure Norm, there's a thousand questions where people want to ask um, about the technology and about what we can do. Let's have it. We have some questions. All right, guys. So I've got um, a few questions here already. I've got um, start off with uh, Yarra B, who asked a question earlier on. It says how to deal with areas affected by mining, particularly arsenic contamination, and also what is the impact of weather manipulation and chemicals falling onto our soil and water supplies. Okay, I'd like to answer that one if it's okay, Andrew, because uh, we're doing some uh, very, very serious work at the moment with PFAS. Now, PFAS is a big problem. It's a chemical that uh, we need to put out fires because what it does is it literally drags the oxygen out of the out of the soil and everything around it, and it destroys. But it's the after effect that once it's sprayed there, uh, you get a lot of problems where you can't grow anything. Up until now, there's been lots and lots of chemicals been used to try and rectify this problem. And all they do is just keep compounding it. They make it worse. Well, our trial so far has showed that not only are we converting the PFAS, now with utilization of bacteria that I've been able to bring together, develop, and what it does is it breaks the PFAS down into many different components. And then what happens is it, it actually then reconfigurates it and it becomes usable. Now, what we've got at the moment, we had, we're doing a trial in one area at the moment where the pH of the soil was way up above 10.5 to 
Nine weeks into the trial, we now have a pH of 6.8. We now have the situation inside the PFAS contaminated area where the bacteria that we've actually applied and we use a carbon to activate the bacteria are now starting to show that it's breaking down all of the heavy metal substances that have attached themselves to the, the PFAS. To the point now where next week we're going to use, we're going to be placing inside this trial area grass seed. That's how confident we are now that we're now seeing the numbers are telling us we've now changed a contaminated area into possibly an area that can grow grasses. And so we're going to start that trial with the grass seed in the next two weeks. But there's one other thing that we're using, we're using nature. We're not going to, we, we do the, the $3,000 and the $4,000 uh, uh, testing regime in the laboratory to show us the breakdown of the actual heavy metals and what the heavy metals are actually are left and all the rest of it. But what we're also going to use is a handful of worms. We're putting worms into the soil and we're gonna watch what they do because they're the greatest instigators and equalizers you can possibly have. It's nature at its best because if they can't live in there at this stage, we've still got work to do. We've still got a little bit more to go. And so they're going to give us a lot of information. So to answer that question, yes, we are very effective in heavy metal contamination areas by the utilization of bacteria stimulated by a sugar-based carbon that we put into the soil and we allow the process to take place. Which we can also do with hemp. Exactly right. Well, where we believe that on the PFAS sites, they will be ideal for growing hemp because the hemp will take up the last of the heavy metals that are still in there, that are dormant, and they will actually utilize it. So right. we have, we finally have, we believe at the moment, and we've still got a way to go, a solution to a very, very serious problem. Good answer. So we've got a, another question here from Wendy Lee. Um, what can the average person do to help help solve the problem for the soil and the farmers? Go for it, Andrew. This is your this is your well, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, I think it's what can you do for yourself individually? Um, you know, I think food food sovereignty and being able to learn the basic fundamentals of being able to grow your own food is is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, but be an advocate, speak out. Um, you know, if you meet people, speak to them about what's going on in our soil and ways that they can actually fix it. And all it takes is you just got to plant the seed, you know, for other, you know, for other people. And you might meet someone who owns three, 3,000 acres of land or a farm that's, that's not being used by which they might be able to say, well, you know what, I'm not using it. Do you guys want to utilize it? Um, you know, and go into an agreement by which you can start a cooperative, by which you can essentially collaborate with other with other food networks and cooperatives and even communes um, around around and take the pressure off our farmers as well. But more importantly, it's being able to provide a direct a direct line into farmers to sell their to sell their produce. Um, and if the corporations and our big a big duopoly of of of, um, of shopping outlets um, start to see that they'll start to adjust, um, and their shareholders will start to see the value in regeneration and decentralization of our food supplies and, and commercialization of it. So, I don't know if that answers the question. I think I may have just gone on a bit of a tangent, but. I think, I think if I could just touch on that on farmers, what can they do for farmers? Well, we need people power that goes into these supermarkets. They need to let the supermarkets know that they've got to show respect to the farmers. Absolutely. It's got to start with the people who actually buy the produce. When the little, when mum walks in with the two little children, 
There's the future. The supermarket don't care about them. They tell you they do. But what is going to make them grow is good, quality, healthy food. Because most women today, or and men, that take go into a supermarket to buy food for their children, they're very hesitant in buying fresh produce these days. They're looking at it. They don't know what has been sp sprayed on it or what has happened. So I believe that when you go into your supermarket, you talk to the people that run those departments and say, listen, you know, you've got to look after your farmers a bit more. You've got to be able to show people power where this has happened. We did it back in, in the, uh, I think it was about 1978 when dairy farmers were laying under trucks and stopping milk supply coming out and turning on their vats and running milk down the drain. Because there was so much imported cheese in this country that our poor farmers couldn't even get a look in. Every supermarket you went into, in the dairy case, it had a very small part of for Australian cheeses and the rest was all imported stuff. Mm. So what I did was I called the farmers into the supermarket and said, well, it's no use complaining about it. Talk to the people who buy it. Don't listen to the supermarket. Talk to the lady who comes in and buys that cheese. And they did. And it completely turned around people's attitudes. It showed people by a little bit of uh, cooperation and a little bit of enthusiasm towards the farmer, they completely changed it around. All of the uh, disputes stopped. Everything went back to normal and farmers got on with their business. And the supermarkets took notice. Because today, if you walk into any of the supermarkets, you'll have a look at how much actual Australian cheese is on show compared to, autom uh, to uh, imported stuff. It's still there. It's still going today. And that was, that was through people power. So to answer that question, I think in some point, what can they do for farmers? Talk about them. Talk okay. about the farmers. Get the farmers top of mind. That's what we want. That's what we need. I've got an extension of that question from Sathya. Um, she just asks, uh, what can the backyard farmer do to help the backyard soil in their own backyards? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's, it's not a hard thing either. It's, it's a very simple. Most backyards, uh, I believe, I do it myself. I grow my own tomatoes and grow uh, my own vegetables in my own little garden that I've got out here. And I do a, a fair bit of research too, having a look at how the bacteria work. But always make sure that you, you look at your soil and see, do a soil test. It's very simple. And there's two things or three things you look for in a soil test. One is pH. The other one is a thing called CEC, which is showing you the energy of the soil. That means what the soil can actually convert and how the, uh, the soil is going to perform. And then, of course, you can then look at your nutrient loads and all your rest of your minerals, which, which come into that. But don't overdo the fertilization. Start with the basic, get your biological activity doing the work for you. Because everything you put on soil needs to be converted. What people don't understand, in a lot of cases they don't understand this, is that it's not the product you put on the soil that makes the plant grow. It's the bacteria and the fungi that is converting that product so the plant can actually take it up. Because the plant only takes up polysaccharides. It doesn't, it doesn't look for prices. It doesn't look for brands. It takes up polysaccharides. And those polysaccharides are produced through conversion of the nutrient and the minerals that you put into the soil by the biological activity and the fungi. And so if you get those counts up and they're very simple to do, it's very easy. Today, you can go and buy a little biometer. And those biometers, what they do is say, you take a little bit of soil and you mix it up in a bit of water and a solution. You leave it for 20 minutes and you put it on, on, your, on this particular little instrument and your iPhone actually reads the level of bacteria and fungi in that soil structure for you. And that, that particular test saves you about $900 for a laboratory to do exactly the same thing. And I think Bunnings and some of these other places do have them. We've got them as well. Yep. You've got them? 
Urban Green Farms has got them. <laughs> I'll, I'll be posting the links again, guys, um, to the websites after this. So just um, check out the chat box for those links. So I've got a question here from Janet Sexton. Um, does a hemp crop Sonic, need to... How are you? Janet, the, reveal the... yourself, Janet. You can take yourself off mute if you want, Janet. Anyway, she says... Janet's up on the, <laughs> up, up the top. There, there she is. Found the mute. Yes. Hi. Hi, Andrew. How are you, Janet? Hi. You see my question there? Yep. Do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Oh, I'll read it. Um, except I can't find it now. Does a hemp crop need to be rotated with other crops every so often or can it be grown on the same soil forever, so to speak? Okay, well, there's no, there, if I could just answer that one, just firstly, Andrew, there, there's no such thing as forever, but what happens in... Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of crops, as you would well know, Janet, they, they recommend that you do one crop and then you rotate uh, to get, uh, and, and the theory of that is to actually stimulate the biological activity that's inside that soil structure at any point of time. However, with um, hemp, no, you don't. With hemp, what happens is you set your soil up right for before the first crop. And then what you're doing is constantly, you're monitoring it as you're going through. So hemp is hemp contains more biological activity inside its xylem than any other plant on the face of the earth and a lot of that bacteria finds its way down through the root system into the into the soil structure itself so the plant is re revegetating its own living place it, it helps itself survive so in real terms you could probably before you need to grow another green crop you would probably do eight or nine crops of hemp, and then you could come back and do a green crop and then start the process again. Fantastic, thanks. Janet, we will help you with those, um, we will help you with those applications anyway. So we're here. Okay, great, thanks. Next question is from Scott Barker. So there's how much does a product cost per acre and how does that compare to the group of 10 family We're talking about that are conscious and again. do the same thing. Uh, I might, just, Scott, I'm going to take you off mute, mate, because um, don't quite understand the question. Oh, I, un I understand exactly what Scott's talking about. Um, what Scott's basically saying is how does the price of the products that Andrew or Urban Green Farms has per acre against, say, traditional fertilizers that we, we use today? Well, we can't take a price comparison at the moment because chemical fertilizers have gone through the roof. I mean, you, you, they're gold at the moment, if you can get them. But the average, average hectare of land with the basic program that you would need would normally cost around about $70 a hectare. Or depending on the crop, it can be as low as $45 a hectare. When you compare it against chemical, if you go through the processes of DAP and you go through pre-emergence and all of these types of things, you generally come up around about $75 to $80 a hectare. So we're slightly cheaper, not a lot, but slightly cheaper than the conventional method. The only difference is we are, we are re-changing re that soil back so that as you go through your next cropping phases, so do you reduce some of the inputs because the biological activity starts to take over and redevelop for you. So, so what they're saying is, as you start to as you start to re as you start to reboost the immune system of the soil, um, eventually, what essentially happens is you reduce your inputs duration. You know, and and that usually happens over I think it's three to five years. Norm, we've seen. 18 months to 24 months is the first first initial hit. Yeah, 18 to 24 months, you start to reduce your inputs um, and allow that biodiversity to really take over. Um, so yeah, it's it's it works in the model, and the model works as well as we've seen. You know, the nutrient density in food 
um, go through the roof. Um, the other thing here, Andrew, if a farmer is using and he's been using chemical inputs for, let's say, 25 years, you can't change that overnight. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is give that farmer what we call an overlay program for the first 12 months. Yep. That overlay program means that we still use some of his chemical inputs, but we overlay it with a biological program. It's like it doesn't cost him any extra. It doesn't cost him any extra because it's all costed in to around about the same price per hectare. Yeah. What it's like, it's like it's like weaning a junkie off 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 drugs. It's, it's exactly. It, you know, you've got to take them off it at that point slowly, um, and that's what we're doing. It's you know, the soil is addicted right now to to external inputs, and it's kind of the same way that we deal with it with humans, and you know, being on on external inputs because their immune system shot. So essentially what this is, is fecal transplanting of soil. So here we are. Um, next, is there any more, anyone, any other questions around that? There's a couple more questions. Actually, Scott also asks, uh, what is the hemp seed you guys promote? We don't promote a seed. What we look for is, the, is we do the soil testing first. We have a look at the soil structure and what the soil is made, what its foundation is made up of. And then that delivers us to find the seed that suits that particular organizer, or that particular soil structure. Um, but also, while we're on it, sorry to cut you off, Norm. Yeah, no, it's okay. Scott, part of the um, you know, part of the issue in this in this country, and particularly in this state, in terms of in terms of the challenges with hemp, is that it's it requires a lot of water, and and on top of that it needs healthy soil and to grow high grade hemp fiber in this country for manufacturing purposes from paper through to lumber, through to, through to fiber, through to everything to, um, pardon? What was that? Aviation. Aviation. Aviation um, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of benefits in terms of creating an, a manufacturing industry here um, requires healthy soil. And to do that, that's where the challenge has been with hemp is that you need a lot of water usage right now under current methods. We can change that and we can flip it over and we could use the hemp to essentially be able to restore the soil at the same time while we use that fiber um, for other, you know, for other means. There's, I think there's two and a half thousand different verticals that we could use hemp for. Well, 6.5 to 6.8 is an ideal um, pH level for industrial hemp. Also, something that a lot of people don't look at when they're growing this type of crumb is hydrogen level. Now, the soil must have a hydrogen level of 1.5 to 2%. And if you've got that, then you're activating a lot of the biological activity that's already there and you're adding to it. And bacteria produce moisture. That's why you can say we reduce the water content or the moisture content because we're substituting it with the biological activity. Mm -hmm. But also they're, that, that they're dragging the a lot of the moisture from the night air. And that leads to soil air as well, which is something that people yeah. don't talk about that farmers don't talk about is soil air is, is, is critical. And it's something that we often say in terms of if there's no soil air, you're reducing the aggregates between it. And essentially you're not allowing that, that soil to breathe. Um, well, you turn it anaerobic. And it becomes anaerobic. And so, you know, we need to switch that. Essentially what we do is we we're switching it all back on and hemp is a great way for us to speed that process up as well in combination with the products but also start to look at how that actually supports local rain cycles as well because when you desertify soil and it's bare 40 percent of our of our rain fall inland comes from local rain cycles and that happens because that's why you have a rainforest it's called a rainforest because you're creating humidity cycles and it creates clouds and essentially we go through the cycle of of rainforests and so that's why part of the most important you know some of the most important things that we need to do is recover and restore our rainforests and our um you know to essentially restore local rain cycles which is part of the problem is we're running out of water we have three percent worth of fresh water left on this planet and 97 percent of its salt um and you can see those studies out of dr alan miller out of the united nations who I've spoken to at length, um, you know, numerous times about this. He's concerned. He, he's, he's got a book called The Three Black Swans. And, 
you know, essentially when you look at history, you look at now, it's that's the only thing that really immobilizes violence and war is full immobilization of war is led by water. Um, and we're running out of it. And that's because of what we're doing. So we can actually start to restore those local rain cycles through regeneration. Any other Any questions? More questions? Got a couple more questions. You guys yep. got time for that? Yes, yeah. we have. Yep. Fantastic. Great opportunity to get it out there. <laughs> so this one's from Murray. Um, I read the first part out, Murray, uh, and then... Uh, so how do we rid ourselves of the supermarket duopoly we have in this country? I think you've already covered this a bit um, at the end of your speech before, but is there anything else you want to add? I think, I think one of the things is it's, it, it, there's an old saying in business, it's called a slow burn. And, and this is exactly what we've done because the supermarkets have got a real good grip. They, they, they force the deregulation of the dairy industry. Now, the dairy industry needed to clean up, but not under the circumstances it was done. The mum and dad farm went by the wayside and the big corporates come in. And that's what the supermarket industry is driving to. It's driving for the big corporates to take over the mum and dad generational farming so that they can control it better. They can control prices. They can control input, output. They can do the whole lot. And, and it gives them a nice little comfort level. What we need to do, we've got to break that cycle. We've got to get farmers to start to fight back. It's not. This is not all about people pay this to people who buy it's also the farmers have got to help themselves and unfortunately farmers are creatures of habit anything past the end of the front gate doesn't exist when it sits on their land they get worried about it and so what we've got to do is we've got to slowly do like programs like you've got here these are perfect platforms to get the message out there to allow people to understand that there is a real disease out there it's a real, and it's growing. It's not just the soils, it's more. Well, let's talk about that for a moment, Norm. You know, yep. I, you know when we first met and, and really when we started to look at, you know, all of these human contracted diseases as well. And, you know, you said something to me that was quite, it was quite um, compelling and alarming at the same time. It was every disease starts and ends in the soil. It's, it it starts from the soil. And I think people need to understand that that's, you know, I, I think a lot of people really don't understand that. Um, and I'm, and tell me if I'm wrong, but um, I think people need to understand that relationship. It'd be great if you could explain that. Well, if we could just use COVID, for instance, COVID is a perfect example of, of soil borne diseases. COVID is, a, is, is basically a bird flu. That's what it mutated into. But its mother load is Fusarium oxysporum. Oxysporum can either be positive, it can be negative, or it can produce what we call a chlamydospore. If it's positive, it has a negative positive aspect to it, and nine times out of ten it'll stay nice and positive. If it's a if it goes into what they call a, a different spore structure, which is a macrospore. It has the ability to produce a negative or a positive or a virus. But when it gets to a chlamydospore, its mutation process is it can mutate 32 times in, 20, in one minute. 32 times in one minute, its mutation value. Now, what it does is that Coronavirus, being a bird flu, if you want to track back its history and its DNA sequencing, it all starts from the poultry industry. It's bird flu. It's mutated. It's learnt how to affect humans. And unfortunately, politicians seen this as a great big soapbox to jump on and have a great old time with it. We've had COVID in this country since the early 60s. It's been here, it's been called so many different types of influenza because that was the type of mutation it was forming at that time. As the soils have depleted, these mutations become stronger and they start flying off in different directions. So when you look at the COVID virus, it's made up of seven, uh, five, uh, four different Brilliant. mutations. Brilliant. But the the... the the, the gene itself is 
H5NI. This gene, if you want to go back into bird flu, you'll find this gene exists all the way through. The only difference is it has learnt how to readapt and remutate itself into the human body. Bird flu and was it's H5N1, wasn't it? Sorry? Bird flu was H5N1. That's exactly right. Yep. It's spot on. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Yep. And so we've got pig swine flu. We've got bird flu. We've got all of these flus. And when you look at the historical journey that they come from, they all start in the soil. White spot in aquaculture, which attacks the shrimp, it comes from the soil because shrimp are bottom feeders. They pick up the virus. So all of these things um, start to mutate through. So, yes, we, you know, I think that journey is, is got to, once we fix the soil, we're going to find that a lot of these diseases will slowly but surely disappear because our soil is our tablet. Our soil is really what's going to fix it. That's what comes down to food is, you know, food is medicine. Yeah. The exactly. Yes. Yeah, well, the food makes you stronger. If you're weaker, then the virus has a better chance of attacking you, as you can see by the people with comorbidities that are yeah, well, it's, getting it, knocked it, off by this. It does. It, it attacks people with low immune systems. And generally, that a low immune system has happened, happened over a period of time. It can be living, living styles and all of that. But a lot of it, when you start to have a look at it, if you look at the, the nutritional value of food today in 2022 to what it was in, in 1940 or 1950, there is no comparison. Today, the food you eat has very little value to you because it's force grown. Every seed is hybrid. It's genetically modified. It goes into a soil structure that doesn't recognize it. So they use chemicals to justify it. And this, this whole cycle continues to keep going. And we've got to stop it. We've got to reduce it. But we can't do it overnight. It's a process. As I said, it's a slow burn. But it can be done. And we need to continue to keep at it. Keep talking about it. As I said, programs like yours, we just got to keep talking about it. Yep. Great. So I've got, I've got another couple of questions here, guys. Um, no one from Yarra B. Uh, shall we use hemp crop as a green manure crop to stabilize the soil before we start growing any produce? You can. This in a small scale. Yeah, you can. You can use hemp to do that, or you can use any any uh, any of the uh, of the the seed crops that are out there. You can even use lucerne. Lucerne is a, is a very good one because it's uh, it's full of proteins, and and you can get them in. One one of the interesting things that we haven't talked about tonight, which I think is a very important point, and and this question is a very good one because it brings this point up. Not many people understand the terminology ADP to ATP. Now, in the soil, we have what we call ADP molecules that get converted into ATP molecules. Once it's, it's converted to ATP, it becomes a protein. It's this source that provides the energy for the biological activity to start converting and do their job. What we destroy and what we, we without realising, well, I think they realise it, but by putting on too much chemical ferts or overloading the system, we generate too much heat. That affects the conversion ratio of the ADP to ATP. Once you do that, then your soil is really struggling. It's the same as your body. We talked about the immune system before. The reason the immune system breaks down is the body can't change the ADP to ATP. It's, it slows down and therefore your immune system starts to get affected because inside your body you have as much biological activity working on a 24-hour structure than you could even imagine everything that your body does is controlled by bacteria and it's the atp that controls them through their ribosome cell so it's it's a whole structure that we need to look at and Someone asked before about the, 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 pro, uh, the products that Andrew was talking about before. As I said, what we have switched off, which is all these things we're talking about now, we switch on. There you have it. Beautiful. Thank you. So, you know, now coming back to policy, you know, we need to look at 
from the point of um, the point of the Australian Federation Party is this is not about which party wins. This is more so right now about what we need to do as a collective, whether it's your left or right, um, to essentially have a future for us. Um, and all we're really hearing is doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. And that's there's something more powerful than fear. And that always comes back to hope. Hope is always more powerful than fear. And that's what got the United States through the Great Depression in the 30s as well, which was they saw a way out. People need to feel like there is a way out. And we can start that. And all it takes is, you know, just like starting a wildfire. It starts in one spot, spreads everywhere. And the more people talking about this, the more people talking about alternatives, the more people promoting and pushing on their friends and families in terms of where the real issues are. Let's forget about what's going on in social media. Let's forget about what's going on with Farmer Wants a Wife and all these ridiculous shows that are out there and TV series and binge binge series watching on Netflix. We need to really have a look at where we've lost our way and what we can do to fix it and dedicate time and effort into it, whether it's economically, whether it's educationally, whether it's environmentally, and we need to start with environment and become stewards of this country. And potentially even we need to learn from first people here and respect them and bring them up you know, bring their laws up to where the Commonwealth laws are. They shouldn't sit below the Commonwealth law. They know this land better than we ever will. Andrew, if we had to listen to them a few years ago, we wouldn't have had such devastating um, bushfires, you know? Here, here. Again, here, here. The bushfire is a result of, des of desertification, yet the logging industry turns around and says, no, you've got to log it. Well, you're going to have bushfires. No, the reason why we have bushfires is because of the logging, because you've reduced the moisture in these rainforests where you've got low rainfall now because you've destroyed local rain cycles. Well, the other thing too, Andrew, they stopped allowing the cattle to go in there and graze. The worst thing they ever did. You never had the bushfires when the cattle were allowed to go into the high country. The cattle don't eat anything that they, they're going, that they don't like, and it will grow back if they do eat it. It makes it better. And by stopping that, they created this underbrush. And of course, when a fire gets in there, it just goes crazy. It's ridiculous. They've got to open that high country back up again. They've got to allow farmers to control it and do it the right way. Well, they've got to do it in they've got to do it in collaboration. That's with, exactly right. With with the Aboriginal communities that yep. their native title. And yeah, they, they've got to work together on it. And that's what we really need to do. You've got unity here rather than division. And all we seem to be doing is creating more division. And until we, as a country, start to acknowledge and tell the truth about what we've done um, to these communities as well, which is, it's, a, it's an atrocity in itself, um, then we don't, then we're never really going to heal emotionally, spiritually, and environmentally so we need to start fixing it and we've got to start from the ground up and essentially what what we need to be is Australia can either be one or two things we can either be the launching pad for war or we could be the brokers of peace and become a light to the world and we have that opportunity we've got one or two options we can degenerate with degenerates and degenerative policies that continue the status quo, or we can regenerate. You take your pick. Good. Any other questions? I've got one last question here, and if anybody has another one, just pop it in because it's, um, we probably should finish this up shortly. Um, so last one is, is, it's a pretty short one. It's from Hans. And he says, where can I get biometers or biometers? Biometers, yeah. Well, um, we've got them in stock. We've just got to get them up onto the site right now. Um, we've got plenty of them. So 
give us a give us 24 hours and then come and slam the website at that point we'll, we'll have it on for you and we'll have a code for everyone that has attended here lovely will that be passed on and put into the the um replay yeah email yep okay fantastic um if everybody has seen that i put the links up earlier i'll just chuck them in there again for everyone one second Here we are, guys. So all the links are there. Um, jump on. If you're not part of our mailing list yet, jump onto the website and go down to the bottom left-hand corner there and sign up. Um, you'll get updates about all these. And uh, also, if you've signed up for the webinar today, then you'll also get that code. So you can buy those bi biometers, are they, Andrew? Biometers. Biometers. Sorry. <laughs> maybe, maybe trouble with that one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem <laughs> fantastic um Thank well you everyone as well um, it's been a pleasure yeah really nice talking to you guys is there anything else you guys want to say before we finish up look i i don't think i think we've covered a, a fair a fair uh issue a lot of the issues tonight uh, we've still got a lot of things we would like to talk about but you know i think people get a as long as we get one or two people from tonight's opportunity or from tonight's presentation go out and actually talk about what we've talked about today we've achieved our goal you know as a as a soil microbiologist you know i see and understand a lot of things that are going on and you know a lot of the 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 problems we see we can we can identify them because we can see them where the big danger is is what we can't see and that's what that's my world I live in that world, and and believe me, I'm seeing things that that are, it's just how it's it's terrifying when I think that we are creating it ourselves. So we've got to do something. So if anyone wants to do anything, as I've said to a lot of people before, if you live in a home and you're lucky enough to have a garden, look after it, because that is part of your lifeline. Healthy garden means healthy household. You have a nice healthy garden. And I can assure you, your children will love it. They'll get the benefit from it. And it'll also fold back into your household. So treat it with respect. Don't overload it with all the, the jargon of chemicals or whatever they want you to put on it. Use common sense. A plant is a living form. If, you, if, you, if someone says to you, you've got to take this and you're not real sure of it, why take it? If you're not sure of something, Jump on the website. We'd be only too pleased to answer your questions for you and allow you to gain a little bit of knowledge at the same time. Great way to end. Thanks very much, Andrew and Norm. Um, yeah, we'll be checking out the website and um, I'll definitely be using your tips on my pathetic garden out the back of my house so <laughs> hey, Jenny, jump on the side we've actually got the pre-sale now for happy soils so we've got bundle ranges and everything happening already so jump on feel free to you know we'll, we'll shoot you out a code and, and we'll go from there definitely we'll be in touch thank you very much thanks guys thanks thank everybody you for very coming. much thanks everybody bye bye yeah